Hello, everyone. We're talking about reversing climate change today, and we've got someone who is dead serious about making this happen, Ibrahim Al Husseini. He's the founder and CEO of Full Cycle, and this is an episode you do not want to miss. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Ibrahim, welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you and grateful that you would take the time. It's a, a, a very important conversation that we want to have today. Uh, for a long time, uh, I found myself using the language uh, mitigating, uh, the word mitigate to describe what we do to avoid or prevent the worst effects of climate change anymore, I think I have adopted reverse, which is what I see you use in some of your uh, work. Tell us a little bit about your thinking about that word. Hmm. Uh, great question. The, unfortunately, the answer is, is that we're past the point of mitigating our carbon footprint and now we have to start working uh, to reverse the effects of our kind of precarious modern civilization and the emissions that we generate uh, that are too much for the earth to be able to restore itself through so it's you know we we basically we're past that point and we now have to start uh reversing uh, uh, well that is um uh, I guess that's the reality we face. Uh, so tell us about Full Cycle and how you intend to use the Full Cycle business to reverse climate change. So Full Cycle is a uh, investment firm that's you know built and designed to identify what we call climate critical technologies and then rapidly accelerate their adoption worldwide so we can transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy as soon as possible. You know, most people don't realize that the problem, uh, even though, yes, you know, a plastic straw and recycling need to be addressed, but the problem is much bigger than that. It falls uh, in the underpinning of our modern civilizations, our water systems, our energy systems, our waste systems. So as soon as we replace those old uh, unsustainable, polluting, inefficient systems with their 21st century sustainable equivalent, we will transition out of the situation that we're in into a more carbon neutral or even carbon negative solution. It's, uh, your plan is to invest in, uh, I want to say new, growing, thriving businesses, but your focus is on businesses that are ready to scale today or maybe yesterday. Uh, tell us a little bit about your thinking. So I, um, I made my money as a venture investor. So uh, a venture investor is, you know, a venture company is those companies that have not yet become commercially viable. You know, they're in their early stages, they're getting tweaked and tinkered with, and they're perfecting their business model or their technology. Unfortunately, the climate doesn't have that kind of time frame. So we are not a venture investor. At Full Cycle, we identify market-ready technologies. That means that they are ready for scale right now. They're climate critical, so they have a vast ability to abate carbon, you know, or a carbon equivalent. Uh, and they just need an accelerant. So we invest in those companies and then we take what's called a right of first refusal to invest in all their projects worldwide so we can be that catalyst that allows them to compress their business plan from let's say, let's call it 100 plants by year 10 down to 100 plants by year five and maybe 2,500 water or energy or waste plants by year 10 because that's what the climate needs. We don't have time for the venture arc uh, anymore on the climate side. So it's a great engine for wealth creation. We respect it, we admire it, but it's not the solution for reversing the climate crisis. As you think about 
building your fund, um, you have talked a little bit about inclusive investing. Tell us about your uh, approach in finding invest investors that makes it, what makes it inclusive? So in the initials, I think, uh, thanks for the question. So initially, you know, our investors are what's called accredited and qualified purchasers. That includes high net worth, ultra high net worth, individuals, families, family offices, institutions, foundations, uh, and those will give us the first big chunk of our capital and the momentum that we need to execute on our business plan. But we also feel that there's a responsibility given our mission uh, to have an exclusive platform that average retail investors or even people who don't consider themselves investors to participate in. And that honestly came to me from these individuals themselves. I would get Twitter DMs from people I didn't know that say, hey, Brahim, I don't have a lot of money. I love what you're doing. I'm a nurse. I have $5,000, I have $2,500. Is there anything for somebody like me to invest in that would be aligned with my values? And unfortunately, the answer has always been, no, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I don't have anything for you. So in full cycle, sometime, hopefully next year, we'll be able to issue investment products for retail investors that allow them to co-invest with some of the wealthiest people in the world on the same platform into the same infrastructure assets such that we can transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy together. Because, you know, as you know, you know, pollution does not know borders and does not know socioeconomic classes. It affects everyone. And sadly, it affects the poor the most, you know, because they can't just leave if their city gets uh, flooded and is underwater or fires burn it down entirely. You know, the, the wealthy, they, they can move to their second and third home while insurance pays to rebuild their existing home. Other, peoples don't have, other people don't have that option. And we feel a responsibility, you know, to solve for this problem together. As you um, work on the fundraising, give us a sense of where you are in the process. How much money have you raised? How much money do you target? Yeah, so we're an evergreen fund. We'll never stop raising capital. In, you know, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change at the United Nations, you know, uh, has told us that we need to invest as a, you know, the whole investment community, not just full cycle, around $2.5 trillion a year in low carbon infrastructure, you know, and that's just to keep us under two degrees Celsius, which is already in itself a awful future. It's not like, you know, we're not talking about restoring the climate that you and I know. This is just to keep us from falling off a cliff, which so we obviously need to invest more because we want to give our future generations the same future that you and I have enjoyed. You know, the ones with butterflies and hummingbirds, you know, right now, even the monarchs, you know, there were 10 million of them when you and I were children, there's 37,000 left. You know, so this is the kind of future that we want our children and grandchildren to enjoy as well. So it's trillions of dollars. We're an evergreen fund. Uh, so we'll never stop raising capital. To date, you know, we launched in November. So obviously there wasn't a lot of action that happened in December between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So let's say from the beginning of the year till now, uh, we have around $52 million and counting of investments. And our first tranche is going to be about $3 million. We have that money already allocated for certain projects around the world. And as soon as we deploy that, we'll go after the next 700 million and just keep doing that as is accelerating. So uh, have you funded any projects yet? Uh, from the, mo uh, so, so far we've invested in a company called Sonova Power. Sonova Power uh, um, is a, what we believe is the world's foremost premier waste to value technology company. And what they do is for the, you know, they convert municipal, agricultural, industrial, commercial waste into a, a, a industry term gas called synthesis gas. And it's called that because you can th synthesize it into biofuels or plastics, or you can ignite it in a gas turbine to produce energy and heat if that's what the area needs. 
And the most important thing about Sonova Power is that they do this at economics that would work in places like Jakarta and Cairo and Mumbai and Shanghai and uh, Cape Town, as well as Berlin and San Francisco, which is a very important point is sometimes in the West, we look at technologies and get very excited about them, but we realize that we're not the largest percentage of the world's population and the world is getting wealthier. So the people in Malaysia and Indonesia and India and China are also wanting the same Western lifestyle that we grew up with. So, you know, that's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of generate a lot of waste. And we need solutions that work for them as much as they work for us. Well, it's, uh, well, it's a powerful, powerful insight. Ibrahim, you've had a successful career. Uh, this isn't your first rodeo. What are you most proud of having accomplished? I, so I guess it's maybe it's a, uh, uh, it's two answers. So the, the personal answer is I'm most proud of, ha of being, uh, of sp being the person that I am given the path, the life path that I've gone through, you know, it's, uh, and I don't mean this to boast, but like the, I should have been a cynical and <laughs> skeptical and crusty person who's been beaten up by life, but I am more hopeful, more optimistic uh, than I ever have been. And I am, um, and you know, my heart's open to people. This is, and it's so much more pleasurable to live that way. So that's my personal answer. My professional answer is I feel like I've opened a lot of uh, minds and a lot of hearts to what our money does in the world. You know, I speak a lot at family office conferences and I tell them what I'm doing with my capital. And sometimes they look at me like they have, like I have three heads, but six months later, they come and tell me about all the good that they're doing with their capital. Because one of the problems that we have as people of wealth is we, may, we let our money go and make money and we don't really calculate how much suffering that does, you know, whether environmentally or socially to other people. We just, hey, you know, and then we try to remedy that with our philanthropic dollars. Well, philanthropic dollars make up, let's say, 5% of our total assets, and 95% is going out and causing the problems that our philanthropic dollars are trying to fix, and that equation doesn't work. So, you know, opening people's eyes to that reality makes them think next time about, hey, do I want to invest in the next coal plant or maybe I want to invest in a solar plant instead. You know, do I want to, um, I don't know, buy a Hummer or a Tesla? Do I, you know, I mean, these kinds of decisions that people don't think about that are now starting to make the link between, you know, what our money does in the world and how we can invest and give uh, with our full self, not just part of ourselves. What's the most important lesson you've learned? The most important lesson I've learned is um, that it's up to us. You know, the, this, um, this illusion that somebody out there is going to take care of what it, whatever it is, unfortunately, isn't true. And we, we have to take inventory of our gifts and we need to bring them to bear with as fierce and full uh, power as we can because the world needs it, people need it. We, you know, we currently live in a world that actually doesn't work, right? You know, the, you know, the Earth's capacity to regenerate itself ended on August 1st in 2018 and, in, and on July 21st, 2019, the rest of the year, we're borrowing regenerative capacity from the future. So the, we're literally stealing from our kids and our grandkids' ability to live on this planet. So that, none of that works. So it's up to us. We cannot sit this one out. Powerful lesson. Now, you, you talk about this principle of not sitting it out. Um, and that's a powerful idea. How did you settle on that? I, I, so many of us can agree 
that there's a problem. And so few of us do anything about that particular problem. And, and let me hasten to add, I think most people are doing something about something, but, but uh, what caused you to engage in this way? How did you make that leap to take the personal responsibility uh, that you advocate? I need to find a better uh, expression than, you know, uh, uh, um, death by a thousand cuts. I want to find the, the, the positive alternative, you know, the <laughs> awakening by a thousand nudges, maybe. You know, so it wasn't like that one moment. Uh, it was many, many moments for me. First of all, I, I'm the son of refugees. And growing up in a geopolitical, uh, uh, precarious reality is is scary you know i mean the basic the basic safety that comes with being a person of privilege you know in a safe environment in a safe country is something that i didn't grow up with i grew up as a second class citizen so i have that sensitivity anyway to suffering because i was on the other side of privilege myself so you know, remember everything in life is a blessing and a curse. So even that gives me a gift and that gift is a certain sensitivity and a certain lens to view the world through, you know? Um, so, I mean, I can name many things. I can name a poem uh, that w woke me up and I'm rephrasing it. It's by Ar Arroyo Mountain Dreamer. And it says something like, you know, when the last tree is cut and the last river is dry and the last fish is caught, we learn we can't eat the money. You know, that really got me, like got me here in my gut. You know, I was a scuba diver growing up. You know, I grew up in a desert and growing up in a desert, there's not a lot of nature. Locust is not very awe-inspiring. <laughs> so, but when I used to go scuba diving, you know, that feeling of awe that is important to all of us, you know, that I encourage anybody who's watching this show or listening to this to go be in nature and experience awe, because that's, that is a, a, like a big part of what it means to be a human being is feeling awe. Well, I used to feel that underwater. You know, I used to sit there on the bottom of the sea and look up at whale sharks, you know, passing above me or a school of tuna fish. And most people don't realize tuna fish are silver. So a school of them with light shining through them creates a disco ball effect. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's fantastic. So this is a perpetual feeling of awe that I'm having with nature, but going back to the same spot year after year, no more whale sharks, no more tuna. We fished them all out. We polluted the place. I'm swimming through bottle caps, bags of chips, and tires, you know, so... Like, and if we really think about that, really think about it, what is the point of becoming wealthy in a planet that's dying anyway? Like if Steve Jobs says, I don't want to be the richest man in the cemetery. Yeah. In order for this, you know, this system that we talk about uh, with reverence so much, this capitalist free market system, in order for it, to work, it actually still needs a planet that also works. We need a carbon map that pencils out. We need a, found, it's not a theoretical exercise. It's, it's grounded in the reality where we have to breathe in air and eat food and, you know, and have a feeling of awe by going up to a, a glacier and seeing it and having reverent, reverence for creation or going underneath the water and seeing a whale shark. I mean, this is the beauty of having financial freedom, the ability to go and experience this beautiful, miraculous place that we call Earth. Well, as you think about, uh, you, you mentioned uh, being the son of refugees. You mentioned growing up in a desert where you were not inspired by the locusts. Tell us a little bit more. Give us a couple of details. Where were your parents from or where were you raised that you uh, were not thrilled with the locusts? Just so we can put a, a, a little bit more color around your story. So I'm, I'm the son of Palestinian refugees. You know, my mom is from a town in, 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 in modern Israel today called Safa, and my dad's from Jerusalem. So, you know, um, 
when the state of Israel got created, unfortunately, my family had to flee, and they ended up in Saudi Arabia and in Jordan, both of which are deserts. So I grew up uh, in a town called Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, on the Red Sea, and, you know, and all we did every weekend is just go scuba diving because that was our experience of nature. And since you brought it up, um, and, and I know you didn't ask this, but we're in this moment of, of speaking uh, about immigration in the United States. You know, if, if you're open to it, I can give you a little bit of perspective from somebody who immigrated here and started an enterprise Please. that, you know, yeah. Please. What's your take? So my take is the following, is, you know, I grew up watching Starsky and Hutch, you know, uh, every Disney movie, you know, I can sing any commercial jingle from the 80s, 90s, you know, that any American kid who watched the same television would sing along with me. I was, you know, America was a dream for people like me, you know, a, a level playing field, a meritocracy, rule of law, a place that, you know, uh, allows, gives you a level playing field so you can become anything you want to become. And I'm worried about that dream. I'm worried about kids like me who dreamt of coming here and building an enterprise. I mean, I've, I've brought in over half a billion dollars worth of foreign investments into the United States. I mean, I, and I love this country. And believe me, immigrants love America because we have contrasts. To us, it's not a theoretical exercise. We know what it's like to grow, in a, grow up in a place where rule of law is applied as a selectively on people, not on everyone. You know? So we don't feel safe in those environments. We feel safe here and we appreciate that and we want to protect that. But what worries me is this anti-immigrant uh, um, rhetoric that's being spread around that says, hey, you're not welcome here, go somewhere else. Well, go somewhere else means the next Google is built somewhere else. You know, Steve Jobs' father was a Syrian refugee. Apple is the biggest company in the world. You know, I would not want to live in a world where Apple is in a, built in China or in the Soviet Union. I mean, sorry, in modern day Russia right. or wherever. You know, I, you know, we have an engine of innovation here uh, that is built on immigrants. We do not want the next Brahim al Husseini or Steve Jobs or Sergey Brin to not feel welcome and decide to go build their enterprise somewhere else. We don't want that. Powerful point. What is your superpower, Ibrahim? So my superpower is, you know, to be gullible enough to know that anything's possible. <laughs> that is perfect. That is perfect. Oh, that we all had that superpower. Uh, it is the true superpower of an entrepreneur. Uh, listen, uh, Ibrahim, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I know you have just a minute uh, before you go. But take, take just 30 seconds, if you would, and, and tell people how they can learn more about Full Cycle and how they can connect with you. Thank you. So uh, please uh, follow me on Twitter at IAlHusseini. Uh, you know, and go to fullcycle.com and learn about our company. And we also have a, a Twitter hashtag full, at, at fullcycle, at I Al Husseini, www.fullcycle.com. We so appreciate the support and the publicity. Uh, and just, you know, let's, let's do this together. It's, it's up to us. Fantastic. Well, again, Ibrahim, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We wish you every success in reversing climate change and hope we'll follow up with you again someday. Me as well. Thank you again for the opportunity. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you for listening. Devon Thorpe's mission is to end extreme poverty, improve global health, and mitigate climate change before 2045 by finding and sharing the stories of those who are doing the most good. You can join with other listeners to accelerate Devon's mission by visiting helpdevon.org right now.